So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria and I am the director of the Symposium of Rising Scholars. Welcome to STEM Talk session 13, where we have four amazing female presenters today. Um, we have four amazing females presenting on a variety of topics within STEM. A fellow member of the Polygens team will be scoring each student's presentation, which will ultimately help us determine prize winners after the event. If you have any questions for any of our presenters today, please type them in the Q&A and we will answer your questions after each individual presentation. So first up for pre presenting is, um, is Shreya. So Shreya, I'm going to pin you to the center of the screen and you can share your screen with your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay, can you guys see it? Yeah, okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, today we're gonna be going through the causes, progression, and treatments of rheumatoid arthritis. So um, a little background before we just start. Um, so basically, uh, why, the reason why I picked rheumatoid arthritis was because um, my grandmother suffered from this disease. Um, she passed away uh, this August, so I dedicated this presentation to her. So yeah, just a little background. Um, so basically, rheumatoid arthritis is a form of arthritis. It's in the name. Um, abbreviated form is RA. RA is an autoimmune disease within uh, the you know group of arthritis. Um, so basically, an autoimmune disease. A little background on that is when um, your own body starts to attack itself. It, it starts to attack its healthy tissue, and because it's unable to recognize itself. Um, it's really similar to an allergic reaction. Think about the time, like, as you know, a lot of people are allergic to peanuts. You eat a peanut, it goes down. Um, what happens to peanut isn't able to be recognized by your body. So you have a peanut and um, think it, it thinks, your body thinks it's a pathogen. So your pathogen has antigens on top of it. There's like little protein bodies. And what happens is your B cells um, secrete antibodies that flag itself on the antigen to tell like the T cells and other lymphocytes to destroy the peanut because that's why you have all this like you know you'll probably get swollen you probably see swelling you'll probably like you know feel ill after eating a peanut so same concept within uh, an autoimmune disease but the only difference is when you have an autoimmune disease uh, your body basically attacks the tissue itself there's nothing being ingested like a peanut or maybe you know chocolate it's just your own tissue like in the body and um, if your tissue gets destroyed, your tissue is really essential. It's basically like a group of cells, right? If it gets tissued, it causes a chain reaction. So tissue after tissue, so your whole body starts getting affected. Um, so the genetic causes of RA, um, so it's not like hereditary, like you're not gonna get it just because your mom has it or like, oh, your mom gave birth to you now, you're, you know, it's getting passed down. It's more gonna be like, um, it runs in the family, so you have a higher chance of developing it, but it's not going to be like, oh, you know, you don't, you're just going to get it automatically. So there's a couple genes that go into the um, play into this. Um, so the HLA-DRB1 gene is like um, codes for the protein uh, that are, are essential for um, the immune system. And when this gene gets mutated, um, the immune system starts to malfunction. And this is one of the highest risk factors of developing RA. Another gene is the HLA-DRB form. Um, it's another strongly associated with RA. This gene is a marker that differentiates two cells, its own and foreign. So when this, this is what tells you, oh, this part of your body, like, or this pathogen is foreign, and then this, like, tissue is healthy. But when this gets mutated, then your body isn't able to tell, oh, this tissue is actually part of my body. It starts to think like, oh, no, it's a foreign thing that I need to destroy because I need to keep my human healthy but it's actually doing the opposite. Uh, this is a TRAF1 gene, codes for uh, a TRAF protein, uh, is basically uh, a protein that helps with inflammatory. So this is, um, uh, and also the C5, that's also a pro-inflammatory protein. Um, this is when you get inflammation, it causes um, problems and stuff, kind of relates, correlates to the symptoms of RA. The STA4 gene um, is a transcription factor that attaches certain segments 
of DNA and controls activity of the genes within the segment. So when this is mutated, another um, reason why the immune system starts to um, malfunction. And the ACP, uh, basically the antibody, is uh, it, um, this, so this is basically like if you have this in your body, you this is uh, something that's used for diagnosis. So if you have this in your body, everyone's going to be like, oh, if you have this, you probably have, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. But the, um, if you look in the picture on the right, um, it says ACP positive and ACP negative. So this is just an indication like you can be positive of RA and not be positive of the ACPA antibody. So just keep that in mind. It's just like an indicator, like when you're getting tested, like blood tests and stuff to see if you have it. But if you don't have it, that doesn't mean you're not capable of getting RA. So symptoms and presentation, um, anything to keep in mind with any disease you're working with, a lot of the symptoms do overlap. Um, you could be sick with rheumatoid arthritis, you could be sick with something else, but weakness, fatigue, fever, that's common in almost anything, basically, like any sickness, anything. But specifically looking at RA, um, since RA is arthritis related, um, arthritis happens in the joints. So you're going to see pain and aching in more than one joint, um, stiffness in more than one joint, tenderness and swelling in more than one joint. Um, and then symptoms, like suppose you have the same symptoms in one part of the body and then you have it in your another part, like one part in the, like the wrist and the other part in the knee. So basically multiple joints, because yeah, in one joint's you know, maybe you just wrote too much one day in an essay, so one joint's kind of sore. But maybe if you're seeing in multiple um, um, joints, you're seeing multiple patterns, uh, then it can mean, you know, something's up, something isn't, right? And there's four stages of RA. So stage one is synovitis. This is like a very, like, um, calm stage. This is just where the symptoms start to show, but everything is like, you're not like, RA, RA at this point. Um, penis is the stage, it's the second stage. At this stage, um, you often start to get to the point where it's RA. It's not completely reversible from this point, but you start to kind of, you can be kind of diagnosed. And then the, um, the third stage is fibrous aneuculosis. This stage is when um, you start to have a little bit of stiffness, your bones start to kind of start to join. And at this point, you're not, your range of motion is kind of decreased. And then uh, stage four is bony um, aneuculosis, which means um, this is the last stage. There's complete calcification of the bone. So basically, as you're progressing through the stages of RA, your uh, stiffness, like basically your joints start getting more stiffer and stiffer and start to calcify together. And once they're completely calcified, um, there's no going back. I mean, surgery, you can do surgery. Surgery can go wrong though, but at that point, it's just completely joined. For population health, um, so just to like a disclaimer, you can get an RA regardless of your age, regardless of where you're from, regardless of where you live, regardless of anything, like RA is susceptible to anyone. However, there are patterns seen within the um, higher areas of prevalence in some regions and others. So the highest um, prevalence is in North America, Western Europe, and the Caribbean. Also, non-Hispanic Blacks, Hispanics, and mixed groups with arthritis have shown to have a higher art um, level. And there's, uh, depending on the environment you live in, if you're, if you live in an environment where you tend to have to, or maybe your job requires you to lift things, maybe you're working a construction site where you're putting a lot of pressure on your joints, it can affect uh, your ability to get a uh, rheumatoid arthritis, even though it is autoimmune disease. Um, like you're thinking, oh, it's just genetics, but uh, environmentals have a lot of things to do with it. So yeah. And it does tend to affect women more than men. Um, this one of the reasons could be like because women have to give birth and during birth, a lot of the nutri nutrients, from, excuse me, from the uh, bone, uh, like the calcium and stuff is given to the child. So in these cases, if, you, if, you're, if a woman is pregnant and not taking enough supplements of vitamins of calcium, you will end up suffering with problems. So majority of this, yeah, it is genetic. Yeah, your genetics do increase it. Yes, it is an autoimmune disease, but there are many other factors that go within population health. Treatments. Um, so for the treatment section, uh, basically for this part, uh, physical therapy, medication, and surgery is all you've got. There is no cure for this. Like you're not going to just, you know, take a pill and then boom, it's gone. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. But um, 
So one thing you can do for medications, um, uh, medications is not to like, like necessarily to treat um, rheumatoid arthritis itself. It's more to treat the symptoms. Um, you don't want to, you know, get it. Uh, you know, you don't. You're not trying to like treat the like rheumatoid arthritis. Oh yeah, it's gonna go away. It's more to for the symptoms, the soothing, the pain. Physical therapy is, I think, one of the most direct ways of treating uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, keeping annual checks and you know going to the doctors, having a physical therapist, uh, moving the joints because again, like I mentioned before, you get your joints are becoming more stiff and you're decreasing movement as you progress with RA. So if you aren't able to, you know, if you if you keep moving it and you know you're not able to, that maybe shows a sign of rheumatoid arthritis, and that's when you want to, you know, get physical therapy, make sure your joints are moving. And this, everything that you're doing has to be under, you know, professional, like you have to be professional about this. You have to go to a physical therapist, you have to go to a doctor for this. You can't just, oh yeah, I need to exercise more or I need to work out more because you don't want to harm your joints within this process. Like I could, if I had rheumatoid arthritis and maybe I'm doing a movement that is more contradicting to like what I want to do and in that point you know going to the doctor and just making sure you have it and making sure you know what you're doing is correct so if physical therapy is great medication is also great for symptoms however if you know at this point you're at stage three you know you're at stage four you, you need to get surgery surgery is an option however you know surgery is a um, pretty painful i mean yeah it's like it's a pretty long process so and this is something that if you get annual checkups you know you can figure out you have this at an earlier stage so it's best to just keep up with your um you know appointments making sure you know you're keeping a good range of motion getting a physical therapist you know decreasing the symptoms by using medications before you get to the point of surgery because uh my grandmother um did have surgery and she it didn't turn out good for her and it actually got worse so uh don't harm yourself by pushing yourself too hard always consult a professional surgery yes but just know the risk and um the problems and then let me move to the next slide comparison to lupus so uh just to give a heads up like this is just like something i wanted to incorporate into my research because I also looked at a lot of people, you know, talking about lupus and a lot of people mentioning lupus. So lupus is also another autoimmune disease and it has very similar uh, concepts to RA and it can be easily confused. Um, basically for lupus, it is a renal disease, which means uh, it, it, it comes, it affects the kidneys. Basically at this point, your nephrons are malfunctioning and your autoimmune disease is affecting your nephrons. Your nephrons is what, uh, basically how you, so, you know, your body creates weights, excuse me, and then it goes through um, your nephrons, and whatever you need is taken out back to your body, and whatever you don't need comes, you know, out in the form of urine, like, you know, you're going to the bathroom peeing, everything you don't need weights, like ammonia, this, that gets out, so basically when this is malfunctioned, um, they're both autoimmune diseases, but the difference is that one place does take one, uh, one kidney is affected, um, the whole body gets affected, and this is way, I think it's a little bit more worse, because if your kidney is malfunctioning, your whole body's going to malfunction. Uh, lupus, uh, another, but the similarities between lupus and other women is that the disease uh, is more present in women than men, and it does have similar regions of high prevalence, but yeah. And I think that's it for my presentation. So thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, please let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shreya. That was wonderful. I knew none of that about rheumatoid arthritis. So I really appreciate it. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to save the questions for you to the end so we can have everyone else have, have their 10 minutes. So next up, Catherine Lee. If you have your slide presentation ready, I will add you to the spotlight. Perfect, thank you. Um, so hello, my name is Catherine Lee and I will be presenting my research on the data analysis of short game shots to improve consistency in golf. So first I'll be going over background information and inspiration for this research, and then I'll move into the details of data collection and data analysis and end with a few conclusions. There are many parts of a golf course, including the tee box, fairway, rough, bunkers, hazards, and more. 
Um, but my research focuses on shots that occur around the green and that are usually under 100 yards. So like roughly within that red circle. And the shots that occur within 100 yards are called short game shots. So what is short game? Short game is the part of golf concerned with around the green approach shots. And the umbrella term short game encompasses many types of um, short game shots all under 100 yards. This research focuses on short game shots for a few reasons. Um, there's less variability compared to longer shots. And although short game only accounts for a small fraction of a golfer's game, it's still a very important part of a golfer's game. Um, and many amateurs are victims of inconsistent short game that cost them valuable strokes. So before I move into the motiva motivations behind this research, I'll go over what club loft, swing size, and ball position are, which were the three variables I changed in this research. So club loft is the angle created between the club face and the shaft of a club, it's pictured on the right. And each club has a different club loft, which allows for different ball flights and ball behaviors. Swing size is how big a golfer takes back their club um, in their swing. And my research tests three different swing sizes, which I just named the small swing, medium swing, and large swing. Um, and I also used and tested two different ball positions in my research, which were the back stance and the center stance. And so this image, um, the two blue ovals are supposed to be the feet and the green circle is supposed to be the ball. So I'd always created methods for my own golf game where I measure how far certain shots go with certain swing sizes and clubs. And I wanted to apply this to a wider group of people in an attempt to help them think about their game differently and improve consistency in their short game. So the purpose of this research is to predict total distances of short game shots based on club loft, swing size, and ball position. This research does not aim to teach golfers a new way to swing and execute short game shots, but rather remind them that they have many options around the green. So when looking for whether there were similar research projects done on short game and golf, I came across an experiment by Andrea Zanardelli, who is a PGA teaching professional. Zanardelli hit shot, short game shots himself, testing five different club lofts and swing sizes, three different um, ball positions, and he hit these shots from three different locations. Zanardelli's research may be harder to apply to a wider audience um, of amateur golfers since he was the sole participant in data collection, whereas my research simplifies short game and collects data from a broader audience so that golfers can use these results to their advantage. And to do that, I only tested three swing sizes and two ball positions from a mat of synthetic grass, eliminating complex shot techniques and very large swing sizes. I also test seven differently lofted clubs instead of five. Now I'll move into the methods of this research. Around 2000 data points were collected from over 25 participants who had varying skill levels and whose ages range from teens to adults. Data collection took place at Golf Tech Englewood where I had access to the Foresight GC Quad launch monitors used to measure ball data. I listed a few contents of this research on the right hand side of the screen. So before beginning the procedure, participants were given instructions as to how to perform the experiment. Um, but in order to save more time to describe the results in this presentation, I will skip over the details of these instructions, but they are listed here. So using the data I collected, um, I created a regression that predicts the total distances of short game shots for 42 different swing combinations. And that's just a result of the seven club lofts, three swing sizes and two ball positions. So I first wanted to test the accuracy of my regression. And to do that, I used results from Zenardelli's research um, as inputs to my regression. So the results for a large backswing, back ball position shot using a 50 degree club are shown here on the left side of the screen. And I just chose a random club loft swing size and ball position um, combination to test the regression. So the model predicted that on a stimp 7.5 green, which is essentially the speed of the green that I set um, my research at, the total distance of a short game shot with those measurements would be 19.8 yards, and that's visible in the table on the bottom right hand side of this screen. I input the same data using a different model that takes handicap, gender, and other factors into account, which is essentially just taking skill and biometric factors into account. Um, and the model predicted that the total distance would be 20.4 yards on a stem 7.5 green, so slightly higher than the previous result. A side-by-side -side comparison of the two charts shows that the table that takes biometric factors into account, which is the bottom table, um, yields distances about 0.5 yards higher than the one without biometric factors. So comparing these results to Zanardelli's results, we can see that Zanardelli predicted his shot would go 19 yards on a stint 6 green, so that's below here, and 21 yards on a stint 8 green. 
with the same large backswing back ball position shot with a 50 degree club. And as a result, it does make sense for his shot to go around 19.8 to 20.4 yards, which are the distances the regression predicted. And this comparison indicates that the linear, linear model predicts um, the short game shots of Zanardelli with high accuracy, even though his results were not included in the data used to make and create the linear regression. So including biometric factors and skill, skill level like handicap and height seems to increase the accuracy of the prediction slightly. The collected data was analyzed in multiple ways using density graphs, scatter plots, and more, um, but I'll only summarize a few graphs during this presentation. So this histogram shows that the frequencies of both the total distances of observed shots, which are in blue, and the total distances of predicted shots, which are in yellow, um, you can see that from this histogram, we can, we can conclude that the model overpredicts and underpredicts the total distances of short game shots. Um, and I essentially concluded that the club loft, swing size, and ball position combinations mostly yield total distances in the five to 20 yard range, um, though they can be used for other distances as well. And so that five to tw uh, 20 yard range is these three bars here. This color coded scatter plot shows observed total distances versus predicted total distances for each club loft, swing size, and ball position. Um, and club loft is re re represented using different colored um, data points, while swing size and ball position are depicted using different shapes. You can see that in the legend on the right. And the regression has a very high R squared value of 0 0.95, which is boxed on the top left corner. And this indicates that the linear regression fits the data very well. So to summarize those three results briefly, we discovered that the data seems to be re reproducible. The club loft, swing size, and ball positions mostly yield total distances in the 5 to 20 yard range. And the regression has a very high R squared value of 0 0.95, which indicates that the linear regression fits the model very well. So these graphs illustrate the collected data separated into facets, which are just those individual graphs. Um, and it seems to suggest that the higher the club loft, the more consistent the short game shots are, which is supported by the R squared values that inch closer to one as the club loft increases. And I was able to conclude that the average total distance of short game shots increases as club loft decreases. So you can see here that the club loft is increasing over, um, over these facets. This figure illustrates the data separated by swing size and ball position in the form of a violin plot. And one can conclude from this figure that changing the ball position of the shot does not drastically change or affect the total distances of short game shots. Um, and you can see that by comparing the bases of the back stance um, small swing and center stance small swing and for also the subsequent um, stances. So to summarize those conclusions, um, changing the club loft leads to consistent short game shots and ball position has little to no effect on the total distances of short game shots. So here I show a couple of tables that I created using the data collected. Um, and the mean total distance for the entire data set was 12.71 yards. And below that the table, um, I've chosen two tables that list the average total distances for a 58 degree wedge and a 44 degree wedge with every swing size and ball position. So for example, using a 58 degree club and a, with a large backswing and back ball position, which is here, um, with, and then comparing that with a 44 degree club, um, medium swing and center ball position, they have very similar distances um, with 13.19 yards and 12.92 yards respectively. And these overlaps essentially prove that there are many options amateur golfers have to execute short game shots of a certain distance and that their ultimate selection depends on their preference and comfort. So golfers may find using a higher lofted club with a large swing more comfortable, but it may be beneficial for amateur golfers to explore using a lower lofted club with a medium or small swing. So a few conclusions can be drawn from this research. Amateur golfers should use these results as a reference tool and basis for their own shot making, since not all the data takes skill, level, height, um, and other factors into account. Club loft and swing size seem to be the biggest variables that affect the total distance of short game shots, while ball position has little to no effect on the total distance. Data seems to suggest that changing the loft of a club and using the same swing size and ball position yields more consistent total distances as supported by the higher R squared values. The data ultimately shows, however, that amateur golfers have many more options and methods to perform the sh um, short game shots of the same total distance, and that ultimately is up to their preference. So in the future, I hope to continue collecting data from diverse participants, um, add the forward ball position to provide more options to golfers, use different ball and club brands since that was a constant in my research, 
um, hit off of different surface surfaces by taking the experiment outside. And my ultimate goal is to create a software that helps golfers predict distances of their shots in real time on the course. So they can just input um, the distance they have left, and then the output would be different club, loft, swing size, and ball position combinations they could use to hit that shot. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Amazing. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was so wonderful to hear. I myself took golf lessons as a young kid, so this is interesting. Um, I have one question before we pass it off to Catherine Liu. So my question is, how do you predict that this data will um, relate to pro golfers? I know you only looked at amateur, but do you imagine that it'll be the same or different? Um, I think it will be a little bit different, um, mainly because pros have more experience, obviously under their belts, and they are more consistent golfers. Um, and the reason why I did choose amateurs specifically is because um, pros do have this method of um, understanding their own distances, but amateurs are more eager to go out and just play the sport. Um, but I did want to at least open some amateurs' eyes to this new way of thinking about golf, because that happened to me as well. I read a book and my eyes were open to the mathematical side of golf. And so I wanted to have that same effect on other amateur golfers who may not think the same way. So amazing. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Okay, so Catherine, I am going to now add you as a spotlight and feel free to share your screen and present. Hello everyone, my name is Catherine and my presentation today will be about the bidirectional relationship between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's disease. To start off though, I would like to give a brief introduction to Alzheimer's um, with a primary focus on some demographic statistics and two neuropathological biomarkers. One in three seniors die from uh, or die with Alzheimer's or dementia, um, and that number is actually projected to increase as the population of our seniors increases as well. Um, currently in 2022, 6 million Americans live with Alzheimer's, and that amounts to around $321 billion worth of care and money spent on Alzheimer's and dementia in the U.S., that cost is projected to increase to about $1 trillion by 2050. So we can see that Alzheimer's is not simply a medical condition that impacts individual persons and their loved ones. It has also economic and systemic implications that could impact pretty much every single one of us. The first biomarker that I'd like to talk about are amyloid beta plaques. Um, and these occur in the brain and they accumulate between nerve cells, which are called neurons. These plaques are made up of amyloid beta peptides, which break down into normal condition, in normal conditions instead of consolidating, which happens in Alzheimer's. A specific peptide, and by the way, peptides are basically made up of amino acids, which are building blocks of proteins. One specific peptide I like to bring attention is to is the amyloid beta 42. Um, and like its name suggests, it has 42 amino acids. And this is one peptide that easily forms these amyloid plaques. Um, and it has just been shown through research that this is one of the primary amyloid beta peptides that are implicated in Alzheimer's. A second biomarker that I like to talk about is neurofibrillary tau tangles. Um, which are part of microtubules in neurons. Microtubules play the important function in upholding cell structure and regulating cell growth. Um, and tau is an important key factor in helping these microtubules remain stable. However, sometimes tau proteins separate from these microtubules and instead stick to each other, which creates these tau tangles. And that then leads to the collapse of microtubules, which then also causes neuronal death. One last term that I'd like to go over is the glymphatic system. Um, and basically its role is to clear waste proteins out of the brain. And so soluble tau and soluble amyloid beta peptides are among these different proteins that are cleared out by the glymphatic system. 
In the second part, I'd like to give a brief introduction to sleep disturbances and especially their impact on memory. Basically, sleep deprivation has been found to, especially over a long time, um, impair memory and cognitive function. And a key part of the brain that is implicated is the hippocampus, which is in charge of long-term memory formation. Basically, what happens is sleep disturbances lead to decreased neuron connectivity. And neurons are really important for memory because the communication between neurons um, allows people to retain their memory and for their brain to function at higher cognitive levels. What happens is dendrites, which if you look at this diagram are kind of the small group or the large group of branches at the bottom, those are dendrites. And so the more dendrites a neuron has, the more connected it is to other neurons and the better it is at communicating. However, when these dendrite spines start to decrease, there is in turn decreased neuron connectivity. It seems straightforward so far that if sleep deprivation has an impact on memory and cognition, then sleep disturbances can likely play a causal role in Alzheimer's disease. But the problem is the human system is so intertwined that we don't actually know if there is a third confounding factor that influences both sleep and Alzheimer's. And so the following slides will kind of go into uh, demyst demystifying this relationship. In mouse model data, uh, we find evidence that poor sleep is associated with amyloid beta in the brain. Basically, scientists deposited amyloid beta into the brains of mice, uh, which then were demonstrated to cause increase in wakefulness periods. When some of these amyloid beta peptides began to consolidate into amyloid plaques, the sleep of the mice became even more disrupted. This shows kind of one direction of the relationship between sleep and Alzheimer's in which progressing Alzheimer's pathology perhaps may cause sleep disturbances. On the other hand, we have also found evidence that phosphorylated tau levels increase when mice are sleep deprived. And basically phosphorylation um, is when a phosphate group is attached to a sugar or a protein. In this case, um, you can see there's the phosphate group at the bottom here. Phosphorylated tau is not harmful on its own. It's found in human fetal brains and many animals when they hibernate, there are also increased levels of phosphorylation of tau. However, hyperphosphorylation leads to instability in the microtubules as we mentioned in the previous slide and that creates some damage in neurons and in the brain. In the specific models that we found, uh, this increase in phosphorylated tau levels when mice were sleep revived kind of give us a couple of hints that may suggest a correlation between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's whereby the phosphorylation of tau occurs with a lack of sleep deprivation. Here I would like to talk about some human data. Um, a lot of preclinical research of Alzheimer's patients who have um, the biomarker evidence of amyloid plaques, but otherwise do not exhibit any cognitive dysfunction, um, have been found to have worse sleep quality than um, people of their age and of similar um, life environments who do not have those amyloid beta, beta plaques in their brain. Another study found that after one night of sleep deprivation, um, with these two sessions taking place separately and at random times, the sleep deprived night caused um, amyloid beta to increase by 30% while tau increased by 50% in the brain. To put these changes into perspective, in another study, there was a 5% increase in amyloid beta in the brain after one night of sleep deprivation, whereas Alzheimer's patients found a 43% increase in amyloid beta burden. Uh, so here we can kind of see that amyloid beta does kind of come along with human brains um, when sleep deprivation conditions occur. Um, another study in 2014 indicated that perhaps tau and amyloid beta, because they are both cleared by the glymphatic uh, system, are implicated uh, by Alzheimer's. Um, and as 
sleep deprivation has been found to restrict the flow of the glymphatic pathway. It may be possible that sleep deprivation also impairs tau clearance and amyloid beta clearance in the brain. So in conclusion with our human data, we find that one night of sleep deprivation does not have much magnitude in terms of its effects on um, predicting Alzheimer's, but it would be quite interesting to study how long-term or chronic sleep deprivation um, impacts Alzheimer's. So here we see um, a diagram where we're not quite sure whether Alzheimer's um, may play a causative role in sleep deprivation or whether sleep deprivation may play a causative role in Alzheimer's. Um, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg, which one came first? Did sleep disturbances cause Alzheimer's or did Alzheimer's pathology cause sleep disturbances? Um, and with all of this data gathered, there are a lot of hypotheses and predictions that perhaps sleep um, simply accelerates symptoms in preclinical pre Alzheimer's patients. Um, given that a lot of studies have found that amyloid beta deposits more rapidly during the early stages of Alzheimer's and more slowly during the later stages of Alzheimer's. For our next steps, I would like to take a little bit of a deep dive into the future of Alzheimer's. Um, currently, most of our data is based off of limited um, animal models and human data, but there are a lot of restrictions for both. In terms of animal models, the treatments that we have developed so far based on the data that we have, have not been very effective um, at preventing Alzheimer's. And animal models, although they do provide us with a lot of key information, are not able to demonstrate the complexity of a human brain. In terms of human data, it is also quite unethical to operate on living persons. And we can use post-mortem brains, but there are simply not enough of these types of resources for scientists um, to deal with in terms of the scope of knowledge yet to be discovered about the brain. However, there are a couple of concrete steps that we can take in terms of stem cells and organoids. Stem cells are human cells that have yet to be specialized, so they have the ability to develop into any type of cell. We can use stem cells to turn them into neuron and nerve cells and study precisely the nerve cells there. We can also use organoids, which are basically made up of stem cells and primary cells from the organism. These organoids replicate the complexity of an organ, and since the brain is such a complex organ, we can use that to study how the brain functions. Ultimately, however, no definitive cure has been developed for Alzheimer's, and as noted before, Alzheimer's is predicted to impact even more people as time goes on. My hope is that by looking at sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's intersection, which is a relatively recent development, um, I can bring more awareness to the neurodegenerative disease especially as part of a generation that is known not only for our chronic sleep deprived state, but we're also the future of science. Um, the topic of Alzheimer's should not be treated as a subject that's completely separate from us. Um, Alzheimer's is not only a fight for the seniors and the scientists in our community, um, it holds equal relevance for all of us young people. I'd like to give acknowledgments to my resources and to my mentors, Emily and Miwa, for their support, their mentorship, and their guidance. If you have any questions, please contact me and thank you for your time and energy. Thank you, Catherine. Wow, that presentation makes me want to get eight hours of sleep every single night. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I do have one question before we um, introduce our final speaker, Cecilia. And my question is, what got you interested in researching this topic? Did you have a personal connection or, or why did you choose this topic? Right, I actually, I have um, hereditary Alzheimer's in my mother's side of the family. And there's a lot of data about how Alzheimer's is much more prevalent in females. Um, and so my great grandmother had it, my grandma had it, my grandfather on my mo mother's side also had a form of dementia, but that was not related to Alzheimer's. Um, and so it initially started as I was hearing all these stories about people who would not remember their relatives. Um, 
And I, because my grandparents live halfway across the world, I was really fearful that someday, because I don't have the opportunity just to walk into their house and to say, hi, grandma, I'm here, um, that maybe they might forget me and my little brother. Um, and so that kind of sparked my interest in it. And then when you add in high school and sleep deprivation and my interest in classical music, which is also found to have um, impacts on preventing Alzheimer's, it just kind of culminated in this idea. Um, and I you know, tried my best to give the fullest presentation of um, the different aspects of the relationship between sleep and Alzheimer's. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I see Shreya laughing, as you say, lack of sleep. <laughs> right, right. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. Okay, so Cecilia, you are up. I'm going to spotlight you and you can share your screen whenever you are ready. Okay. Um, uh, so today I will be talking about the impact of climate change on animal behavior in two different marine ecosystems, the Arctic marine ecosystem and the Monterey Bay ecosystem. Um, so this is what I will be talking about today. And uh, so first I'll give you some background and importance on climate change and animal behavior and kind of what I have studied in this research project. Um, so first, what is climate change and what is the importance of it? Climate change is the long-term shift in the global climate, either in temperature or weather or something else. And it threatens our planet. Both human lives and animal lives are at stake as a result of the various effects of climate change and the rising sea levels, melting ice, and global warming, and much more. So scientists study climate change in order to counteract global warming and protect the planet and the lives on this planet. Um, and why is animal behavior important? Well, animal behavior, studying it, can reveal re reasons behind species interactions and animal responses to their environment. It can also allow scientists to gain a deeper understanding of evolution and animal adaptation to various challenges that their environment may present to them. And any shift in the behavior of even just a singular species could incite a larger chain of reactions in the ecosystem that they live in, particularly if they're, they are a keystone species, which is a species that moderates um, other species populations in their ecosystem. Um, so how are these two things related, climate change and animal behavior? So climate change has affected animals in many negative ways by destroying their habitats, by removing their food sources, or even preventing them from giving birth sometimes. And as a result of climate change, a lot of animals may become unfit for their habitat and they either have to adapt in situ or migrate elsewhere to another region of the ecosystem in order to survive. And these changes in animals' migratory and behavior will actually impact both interspecific and intraspecific relations. So relationships between animals within the same species and animals of different species. And the combined impact of these various animal behavioral changes can end up forming a major effect on the ecosystem and also may even affect the global climate as a result of the kind of combination of all of these changes in animal behavior. So, so what? Still, why is this so important and how does this impact humans? Well, firstly, Comparisons between organisms' responses in two different ecosystems can allow scientists to gain a deeper understanding in the changes behind animal behavior, and as a result, they can also gain a further understanding in the changes behind human behavior and the relationship between animals and humans and their psychology. These studies can also pave the way for future predictions for how climate change will affect different species in other ecosystems and other similar ecosystems, such as perhaps marine ecosystems along the Pacific coast. And this will also introduce potential new methods 
of observing climate change globally, as scientists will have a better idea of what they need to observe when it comes to animals and animal behavior. Um, so I chose to study two ecosystems along the Pacific coast. And for each ecosystem, I chose three species. Um, so the first ecosystem I chose was the Monterey Bay ecosystem. And this is a ecosystem that I actually live pretty close to, which is why I chose it. Um, so it is a marine ecosystem in the Northern Pacific Ocean on the California coastline. Um, so it's in Northern California. And a lot of human activity affects the different animal behaviors and species that live in the region, such as fishing, boating, surfing, and these all often lead to increased population and can threaten the hundreds of species that live in the area. And also, as a result of climate change, the temperature of the sea surface in Monterey Bay is rising rapidly. The storm winds and just various weather patterns are intensifying. Sea level is rising and also becoming more acidic. So the three species I chose were seals, sea otters, and dolphins. Um, so for seals, there are many different species of it. And as a result of the warming Pacific Ocean, there is actually an increased population density in the Northern Pacific Ocean, but overall their population is decreasing um, globally because due to the significantly smaller amount of sea ice and the rising sea level, fur seal pups are being born later and they're actually significantly smaller as you may see in this graph over here. Um, another species I chose were sea otters, which are the keystone species of Monterey Bay. And that means that they regulate other species populations because they're kind of the centerpiece of the different species and the food web in an ecosystem. And they have an increased variation in diet and prey selection, which is changing their predation behaviors. And because this is happening because of the fluctuation of sea urchin populations, which is their most common food source. But since sea urchins are declining in population, sea otters have to seek alternate food sources in order to survive, which may cause new um, inter intra and interspecific relationships and interactions to occur. And the last species I chose were dolphins. So at first, many species of dolphins in the Monterey Bay increased around the end of the 20th century, and large groups of dolphins migrated into the Monterey Bay area in search of larger prey, such as squid. But however, these large populations actually caused the population of squid to decline after dolphins moved into this region. So then dolphins left it again come um, around 2002. So this kind of like fluctuation of dolphin population densities in the Monterey Bay has caused like a lot of problems in overall dolphin populations because of their change in migratory behaviors, which ends up affecting them in a lot of different ways. So the second ecosystem I chose was the Arctic marine ecosystem, which is significantly larger than the Monterey Bay ecosystem, but it is also a marine ecosystem that is close to the Pacific Ocean. So the Arctic marine ecosystem is a marine ecosystem in the Arctic Ocean that is home to thousands of species, and it has a lot of sea ice and snow, and it relies on snow for precipitation, which comes, which makes up a large volume of the water. As time passes, more and more humans enter the region in kind of like the northern hemisphere for residency, tourism, or fishing, which also, like the Monterey Bay, increases pollution in the area. And since 1980, more than 50% of the permanent ice in the Arctic ecosystem has been lost, and it is decreasing rapidly causing a lot of the species in the area to suffer from this decline amount in sea ice. Um, so these are the three species that I chose, seals, polar bears, and whales. So 
Seals like in the Monterey Bay are composed of a lot of different species of specific seals. And as the amount of sea ice on the seas is decreasing, seals must also immigrate further. And like the Monterey Bay, they face the threat of declining reproduction rates. Polar bears, which are the keystone species, actually um, affect also a lot of the different uh, species in the Arctic marine ecosystem. And they have become more dependent on their terrestrial habitat use. So they're actually on land more, which you can see the distribution of their um, time spent on land increasing um, in this graph here. And then the last species I chose was whales, which is also composed of many different species of whales. And what they do is their migratory behaviors are changing as in, um, in time, they will be traveling further north and staying longer in more northern places, which will also affect their distribution. So, um, sorry, I moved backwards. Okay, so some comparisons between these two ecosystems. Um, so first, these are all tertiary, um, tertiary consumer mammals. And they do not typically adapt quickly, but they have to in order to contend with climate change. And both ecosystems face similar threats of climate change, and it threatens the habitats of many species in the area. Um, changing climate has also altered many interspecies interactions, and also species in both ecosystems are declining as a consequence. Um, so I'm just going to go through quickly through the differences between these two ecosystems. Um, so these are like the different, this is a chart of the different behavioral changes of the different species. And though there are similarities in how they change, the ways in which they change have been different. Um, and some conclusions are, so many species are migrating in greater densities into the Monterey Bay region, but overall they will overpopulate and eventually decline in population. And the Arctic marine will also see an overall decline in species populations in the area. And overall, organisms in both these regions will continue to shift their migrational distribution, predation, and reproductive patterns. Um, so my study will allow future scientists to predict animal behavior in response to climate change and allow scientists to gain a deeper insight into the way in which animal behavior works and the likely ways in which different species will respond to climate change. Um, future scientists could consider more species or select a larger variety of species. They could look at food webs and study different regions and connect them in order to better understand the similarities that bigger regions share in order to gain a deeper understanding and changing animal behavior. That's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Cecilia, and thank you to all of you wonderful presenters. We are a few minutes over time, and unfortunately, we have to run. But I do want to ask just one quick question for Shreya and Cecilia so that they have a little bit more to talk about. Can you just quickly tell me what the most difficult part of your research was? Shreya, you can go first. Okay. Um, so um, the most difficult part of my research uh, was probably, I would say, finding like the genetic background of the information because there were so many like, because honestly, with an autoimmune disease, genetic plays like a, a huge factor. But then you also have to like, you can't like just, but a lot of people like tend to focus on environmental factors like, oh, you know, that person has a different job than this person right or maybe oh one person is like typing for too long so then their wrists are like right so it was i think uh the hardest part definitely was finding genetics of it and going in depth finding out how each genetic factor uh contributed to what part of rheumatoid arthritis because there was like a bunch of genetic things that went into it and i was so i was real i was really inclined to like the environmental part of it because i really wanted to connect oh how can like humans and other people relate to what I'm trying to talk about and see, oh yeah, this applies to me because I do this type of job. Or maybe, you know, I like, yeah, I know someone who has that. And then, right. So for me, it was like 
just going like more with the scientific view of it and then the more biological view of it of like the genes rather than just like oh you know this is what how you get it but yeah thank you thank you and what about you cecilia very quickly um i think for me it was mostly like choosing which species were the most important because both ecosystems have a lot of species so it's kind of hard to decide like what species would be considered more important so I ended up just choosing keystone species and similar species also I'm really going over time no that's okay well thank you so much all four of you for your wonderful presentations I encourage you to continue browsing the symposium and seeing other students work and I will talk to you all later bye thank you